uh, award-winning news anchor on Univision. And Gabrielle, I'd love to hear uh, just in a couple minutes here, the condensed version of how you got into this work and what you're doing day to day these days. Well, um, I first want to check everybody hears me well. Yeah, is that good? Yeah. Fantastic, phenomenal. Okay, so well, hello everyone. I'm a news anchor and my day to day is more hard news. However, my passion is environmental with focus in the oceans. So I have done a lot of work in the oceans um, as in reporting about these stories. And I was just listening to, to Francesca and to Jules talking about how to address and talk to people that actually want to just go into the tide pools and take something with them. And that is exactly the focus of what we do. We want to make people aware of what is out there in, in, in nature and in the ocean and the dangers of actually pulling it out and taking it home. And, uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm saying all over the place, we talk to people and experts everywhere. We harness on everything that you guys as scientists, as people that are in the front lines can give us so we can show them what it is out there and so that they can learn to love the ocean, respect it as is, and actually stay, uh, you know, in, in the contemplative uh, place and not really um, grabbing stuff and taking it out. We do hard work with all with many organizations. Many of those uh, are present here today and are um, and are supporting this event. So I want to thank everybody for what the hard work they do. Thank you, Gabriela. I'll now turn to Ken to introduce yourself. And Ken brings with him three decades of experience uh, reaching mass audiences through his work with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So tell us what got you into this line of work, Ken. Well, thanks, Alicia. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Uh, I'm Ken Peterson. My pronouns are he, him. And I am currently senior communications strategist at Monterey Bay Aquarium. But as uh, Alicia said, that's the end of a or the middle of a 30 plus year career at the aquarium. Like Gabriella, I used to be a journalist working in print journalism, covering a lot of coastal and environmental stories, uh, including uh, some of the early fights against offshore oil and gas in California in the 1980s. So for me, uh, coming to the aquarium became sort of right livelihood in a career transition and really lets me turn personal passions um, into stories that will affect and move and change behavior. Um, I'm doing a lot now with uh, executive communications and other types of messaging. And uh, I just popped into the chat um, an op-ed from our executive director, Julie Packard, who you may have heard from earlier today, you'll be hearing from later about coastal wetlands and their critical role in uh, managing climate through blue carbon and, and, and nature-based solutions. So helping with things like that and really using the power of the platform that Monterey Bay Aquarium has to inspire people to care more and do more for the ocean. Great, thank you so much, Ken. And last but not least, we have Greg Long here with us to share some stories. And Greg brings the experience of a different type of audience who might get involved with ocean conservation surfers. He is a professional surfer and an influencer and now spends his time helping others take care of the ocean. So Greg, tell us a little bit about why you're in this line of work and your story. Thank you so much. It's an honor and privilege to be here with everyone. Uh, most people recognize me uh, from my background as a professional surfer, primarily focused on uh, big waves, which consumed the majority of my life when I was about 15 years old uh, till 30. So I uh, grew up uh, immersed in the ocean and my father is actually a lifeguard. So I came from, uh, I think, a more educational background than most kids had, which provided the foundation um, for an incredible career. And it was actually through my international travels that I really started to experience firsthand, you know, a lot of these environmental challenges, um, and especially in developing countries, uh, being impacted, you know, in a much harsher level, you know, here in the United States, and uh, started to have, gain my own personal awareness going through the years, and then eventually got to a point where I just, in good conscience, couldn't continue to, you know, utilize the ocean as a resource, you know, to thrive in my own personal life, seeing. Um, uh, you know, really, you know, the challenges on all fronts that we're up against. So for me, it became, you know, a reflection of how can I use the space and what I've created in the surfing and ocean community uh, and what I've seen and what I was learning from, you know, individuals traveling around the world, started working with different conservation organizations 
and using that reach that I had to, you know, share that information, the education and connect people to these organizations uh, and people who are at the front lines and, and have solutions. So it was really just kind of going back into, again, you know, the ocean community and, and finding ways to creatively get stories and messages out and captivated, get people more engaged. So that's what I've been really involved in uh, about the past 10 years of my career and still, of course, surfing as much as I can. But uh, the conservation is really the primary focus. Thank you so much, Greg. And thank you to all three of our panelists. We're going to share a lot more of their experience um, and what it's like to be telling stories on those front lines. Um, so just thank you again for these initial stories. And I just want to focus really quick before we get into the meat of it of why do we tell stories? Why is it so important to be telling stories? I actually believe that every single person on this Zoom call right now has a story to tell that can influence conservation action. And we know that it's important to tell stories because of a massive and growing body of research from neuroscience, from psychology, from sociology, that shows that as humans, we are storytelling animals. And I'm going to read you this quote in a second from Jonathan Gottschall, whose 2012 book, The Storytelling Animal, um, sums up this research quite well. So he says, when we read nonfiction, we read with our shields up. We're critical, we're skeptical. But when we're absorbed in a story, we drop our intellectual guard. We're moved emotionally, and this seems to leave us defenseless. And we actually know that not only do we take our guards down, we turn off the skeptical parts of our brains when we listen to stories, but we actually turn on the empathetic parts of our brains. And I love this picture to the left here because you can see that in action. These little kids, are having the same emotional reaction as the protagonist in the story. And that in a nutshell is what's happening. And we know that empathy, that empathetic part of our brains is the precursor to actually taking action. Um, my colleagues and I at Wonder Strategies for Good help change makers around the globe to harness the power of storytelling and narrative to actually make progress on issues that we care deeply about. And in 2017, we were approached by the kind folks at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation to really dig in to how we do this for ocean conservation. And we spent three years conducting nationwide surveys, doing focus groups, testing different messaging interventions, uh, and then we spent another two years helping advocates and conservation organizations actually field test those recommendations. So we know that what we're presenting right now works. I'm going to try to condense five years of that research into just a few minutes here and really help you understand how and what types of stories we need to be telling about the ocean to drive action. We learned through our research that there are six primary mindsets when it comes to ocean conservation. And I like to think of these mindsets as, you know, they already exist in people's heads, right? So if you are kind of predisposed to taking action on the ocean, you come to the table through your, you know, vast lived experience, through your identity, through your beliefs, through your values, through your emotions, with these kind of already embedded. And when we tell a story and help people turn on that empathetic parts of their brains, we're effectively flipping the on switch for these mindsets. So they move from being implicit in the background to being, okay, now I'm ready to take action. And I'm going to share in detail a few of these, or actually all of them, in just a little bit more detail. And as I do so, I invite you to consider a few questions. So first of all, when you think about your own communications and your storytelling, which of these mindsets are you most successful already in activating? Secondly, which would you like to do a better job at activating? And thirdly, which would be the most difficult to activate? So the first mindset that I want to bring um, up and share is the all senses mindset. And I see from the comments of the first memories of the ocean that many of you actually share this mindset. For me, it's big waves, right? It's the, uh, the sand between my toes, the sound of the waves, right? It's just that very vivid sensory experience that we have when we're at or in the ocean. 
we can activate this mindset through our stories by using very vivid multi-sensory descriptions about people and families playing in or near the ocean. The next mindset I want to share is God's beautiful creation. And the motivation behind this mindset, you know, people who are motivated through their faith, um, they feel strongly that the ocean is God's beautiful creation. The way that we can actually activate this mindset is by allowing people who can speak authentically and genuinely about how their faith motivates ocean protection to do so and to share those stories. And I want to share that in our, in our surveys, um, in our research, we found that a huge segment of the U.S. population brings this mindset to bear when it comes to ocean protection. And in order to really expand the ocean protection movement, we really do need to do a much better job of um, lifting this up and highlighting this motivation for folks. The third mindset is one that I think many of us also share based on um, the comments that I'm seeing about people's first memories. And this is the amazing wildlife mindset. So the motivation here is that the ocean is filled with the most amazing wildlife on earth. We see it as a place that's uniquely situated, uniquely um, there for all the creatures of the ocean, right? And we can activate this mindset by sharing stories, our own or others, of people interacting with wildlife, right? And then also pair these stories with call to action messaging that spotlights that need to protect wildlife. The fourth mindset I wanna lift up is the laws and policy mindset. And I loved in the last panel hearing from Ken and Francesca and some of the others about how um, advocates have succeeded, right? Persevered through challenges. I think Ken said they spent two years of setbacks and then another two years of setbacks. And it actually turns out that people with this mindset are very activated by hearing about successes, right? Um, perseverance through challenges. And the other way that we can activate this mindset, which rests on the motivation that, that people have the power, right, to pass laws and policies that can protect the ocean, is actually by painting a very vivid picture of today without current laws. What would have happened, you know, had we not have the marine protected areas passing, right, um, or a future where something like this doesn't pass. The fifth mindset, and I'm, I'm almost wrapping up here, is that um, the feeling at peace mindset. And I saw somebody put tranquility as their first memory of the ocean. And I would guess that that person has this mindset as well. For people with this mindset, when they're at the ocean, it's a time when they feel serene, right? It's a time when they feel at peace. And we can activate this mindset by sharing those shared lived experiences through our stories of having that really deep sense of peace and feeling. And then finally, last but not least, and one of my favorite mindsets is the family traditions mindset. And again, for people with this mindset, they really see the ocean as not just a place, but a truly emotional experience that brings back their lived experience and their identities as family members, um, their memories of spending time with family at the ocean. And we can activate this mindset in service of conservation by sharing real stories of families bonding near the ocean communicating about what the ocean allows us to do to protect as a family, including transmitting family values through the generations. And again, I saw in some of these first memories, someone shared that, uh, you know, they remember swimming with their grandmother and you can see that people truly do connect with their families there. Uh, so now you know why stories are important, the mindsets that we have to tap into to drive action and to create a more inclusive and broad ocean conservation movement. And I invite you again to just ponder those questions that I put before you earlier and enter them into the chat if you desire. Um, I now wanna go over to our panelists and I would really love to hear from you, Ken, about your experiences. And now we know about some of these mindsets, but tell us more about some of the storytelling strategies and some of the mechanics of how you actually curate the stories you tell to drive action. Um, Ken, over to you. Thanks, Alicia. So the mind, it's really interesting because the, the hardwired mindset framework is not something that we've been working with for decades. It's, it's fairly new and it resonates really well and it's definitely informing 
how we tell stories. Uh, but I have to say, based on my experience, we've been using and 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 it, uh, those different types of mindsets as uh, a storytelling uh, tool for quite some time. And it's because at the aquarium in particular, you're dealing with, in, in a typical year, a couple million people who are coming in to visit, not necessarily coming to become ocean protectors, uh, not necessarily motivated by conservation. They're there because we're halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles, and we're one of those places you need to stop. And they walk in the door, and we need to meet them where they are. And I think that's true for everyone with whatever story you're telling and whatever organization you're part of. You really have to understand and know your audience, what their expectations are, because in the end, it's not the story that you want to tell people that's important. It's a story that they want to hear or are receptive to, to, to hearing about. And uh, so that's how, how we approach our work. And the power of the aquarium is we do have that amazing ocean animal, heart-wired mindset. People can walk in there, they can see the kelp forest, which is behind me in my uh, Zoom screen, and their jaws drop and their hearts open up. Their mouths are like those little kids in the storytelling scene, and they are just wowed. And now that they have fallen in love and that they are really just emotionally moved, they're ready to learn more about the creatures in front of them. And part of that learning and part of our storytelling responsibility is then to say, things may not all be perfectly right for these creatures and the environment that they need to thrive. There's a threat that they're facing. And people who've just now fallen in love are shocked, they're saddened, they're energized. It's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea, what can I do? And that's when we step forward with, with some practical solutions they can implement in their lives. And maybe they're going to be writing a petition or writing a letter. Maybe they're going to be cleaning up trash on a beach. Maybe they're going to be joining one of your organizations to further ocean conservation. So having a suite of activities that meet them where they are and move them in the direction we'd like them to move is, is critical. Uh, I've had a chance to work with some really great mentors in storytelling. Um, the Heartwired Framework uh, is one of the tools there. There's a fellow named Andy Goodman at the Goodman Center who is a master storyteller, works with a lot of nonprofit organizations. And I'm going to drop in a link for the Goodman Center because he's put together some incredible resources, including one about why bad presentations happen to good organizations. And it's really a simple way of reminding us that it's not statistics and sheets of facts, it's stories that are going to be the most powerful and compelling tools we can bring to our service. The other uh, individual Sorry. I learned, oh, go ahead. Uh, the other individual I learned a lot from was someone named Trip Frolicstein. Uh, he's passed on now, but he developed a concept that others have similarly created called message mapping. And it really starts with what is the core objective of your organization? What is the mission that brings you to work every day at Monterey Bay Aquarium it's to inspire conservation of the ocean. Every story you tell should connect back to that mission. And the way human brains are wired, not just to hear stories, but they can hear a main idea and three supporting points. A reporter can take those down or the mind can, can, can fix on that three-legged stool of a story. And if you can tell all of your stories in that construct, get back all of the information getting back to that critical central mission, then you're, you're gonna be successful. The last thing I'll say, cause I know we have a lot of folks to talk today is who's the storyteller? The storytellers have not been representing the full diversity of the people out there who are involved in the issue, care about the issue, whose concerns, whose passions are reflected in what needs to be done. And, Elevating a diversity of voices uh, is more critical than ever to reach the audiences that we want to move. Thank you, Ken. Great reminders on needing to meet your audience where they're at and help your audience really see themselves in the stories to be able to take action. So thank you for that. Um, Gabriella, I wanna turn next to you. And in your role as a news anchor, I'm sure you've seen 
every single day the power that stories can have for for moving people and shaping hearts and minds. Um, is there any particular story that you've covered that has had a, a bigger impact or a set of stories? Well, uh, uh, I'm going to say uh, our, our stories are calibrated in such way that we try to make a big impact every single time. It's hard to measure sometimes because you go out there with a message and then you you have to wait for it to kick in and then to try to wait for it to actually uh, to actually be able to measure the impact. It's hard sometimes. Um, Laura is going to sh uh, share right now some images of uh, one of our stories. That's one of our news anchors at 6 p.m. And I did this particular uh, story on uh, oceans in danger. And as we move through the uh, through the story, you're going to see that we talk to at least six different experts from six different places. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the story. What you're looking at is at footage from uh, a company that what they do is go out there in the ocean to pull out ghost nets, which is like fishing nets, gill nets that have been lost in the ocean. And they just swim there capturing still wildlife and just killing it. You're looking at images from stock, uh, from, from uh, the market, the Tsuchiki market in, in, uh, in Japan, which is a place where you see 450 Mail. different products, 400 different products of the Mail. ocean. It's crazy, it's so much. Um, we, we, we come up with hard data during the story so that people can actually get a grasp of what we're talking about. We're talking about $153 billion in marketing uh, fish uh, fisheries and stuff. And that is in 2017. So at this point in time, I think that the global fish and shellfish market must surpass that. It's probably $200 billion for the United States. Um, so we talk in that story, as it continues to, to move, we're going to see, for example, we talked to somebody at, with a program called Fish for the Future. What they're trying to do is to have people understand what they're eating and when they're eating it. So they're more conscious of what to eat when. We have talked to uh, an Equatorian guy, um, a marine biologist from, from uh, Heal the Bay, amazing organization that supports us all the time. In that same story, we talk later to the, we have graphics from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Thank you very much. Can we use those, those graphics because we don't produce them and they are the experts on that. Then we go back to the Aquarium of the Pacific, I go swim with the sharks. Um, then we talk to, uh, we have some other graphics from the Monterey Bay, um, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Then we talk to somebody from NOAA. Then we go in the ocean with a fishing boat with three people. The reason why I'm explaining you all of this is because I want you to understand that all the detail that goes into one story. We just don't sit there, write it, and fill it up with video that we get from somebody. We go out there, we jump in the ocean, we pull those nets out. And at least for us, there you see me, I'm pulling that thing out, the nets out, and we're, we're measuring them and we're weighing them. And, and it is for me and for Univision, a big endeavor. So we, I'm here today because Azul invited me as well. So I tell you, we talk to everybody who wants to give us a piece of information that will help us convey the message of how the people can support all the resources that there are in the ocean and stop overfishing and all that. Now, we talked to about seven people in that story. Two of them speak Spanish. That to me is a major problem. Considering that we're in California, I should have access to so many other scientists that do speak Spanish. And the reason is simple, as we were saying, you know, we have just look at the population, just look at our demographics. And I know that they're there. I just need them to have more of a voice. Not that I have to be digging into who is going to give me that sound bite. And uh, I really need them desperately. I need those same graphics from Monterey Bay Aquarium with Span with, with subtitles in Spanish, and I have to fabricate them. So, uh, so our, our intention to help save the oceans and our, our intention to, to, to get the message through has to be better supported. Uh, quite honestly, I went many years ago, about 16 years ago, to my news director and told them, hey, I want to do environmental stories. And he told me, well, really? So good luck with that. So he gave me a little bit of a chance and I started doing all these stories. 
Um, we've gotten a lot of awards, many, many, many awards for our environmental stories. And I'm very proud to say that whenever there's something big happening, they call us because they know that, I mean, I'm talking about my producer and me, two people team, thank you very much. And we put all this together. We work super hard because we really believe in, in, this, in this particular um, topic. We really think that we need to have again, more access to tell those stories. I'm going to also say, Laura, uh, um, Alicia, real quick. Um, yes, what you said about the family is so important to the Latino community. And what you said about the amazing life and the, uh, the ocean life, and what you said also about God's uh, beautiful treasures, those three are key elements of our stories. They have to, because they touch people's hearts. At least the Latino community reacts to that very wonderfully. We still have not gotten in touch with the policy making. We're working on that, but uh, the rest of the elements are key to our messaging. Thank you, Gabriela. Wonderful points and certainly huge need to broaden the resources and not just make this about one tiny community. We cannot do it, right? If that's the case, right? It's a worldwide initiative. Um, and Greg, you have experience, a different type of experience reaching audiences, right? Um, we have the aquarium perspective, the news perspective, and you've been out there organizing on the ground. So tell us more about that and tell us about how you introduce new and unlikely audiences and specifically if there's any channels or tactics you've used that, that really brought in that audience. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Um... So I'd like to go back and touch on something that you spoke to at the very beginning, Alicia, and that is every individual has a story. We all come from such unique backgrounds, upbringings, perspectives, uh, life experiences that somewhere within the journey of our lives, you know, there's a unique story that is going to resonate with somebody else out there. Um, for me personally, uh, as I mentioned, I came from a professional surfing background. Uh, and I'll be quite honest, I use that as bait to lure in people who are, you know, not going to be expecting or who otherwise wouldn't come to, you know, a conversation about environmental conservation. Uh, you know, that, that is, you know, what I dedicated my life to, you know, where a lot of people recognize me and would be willing to take the time to come listen to me. And so it quite frankly, you know, as I said, and I always joke, you know, it's my bait to bring them into my trap to talk about, you know, the bigger picture and what's actually happening in our oceans and in simply sharing you know what i've seen um uh you know as i've traveled you know what i've experienced firsthand uh there's you know lines that are tossed out there and you know the big part with storytelling i'm sure you know gabriella can attest as ken you never know who you're going to reach and oftentimes you're just putting it out there um you may reach one person who it changes their life forever and it may fall on deaf ears for however many you know of, of an audience if it's you know 10 if it's 100 or a couple of thousand um so to simply not shy away you know from sharing what you have and what you are passionate about for me was one of the greatest lessons um i'm an introvert by nature and one of the hardest things for me was to get over that idea of like oh well I, you know i just don't like being in front of the audience. I don't like being the center of attention when I was in a position to actually utilize that and, and put myself out there. So um, for me, you know, the most you know, passionate kind of storytelling is, is in person. That's where I really feel like I connect best with people. So it, it took a lot to you know, learn to be comfortable you know, to speak in public. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, as far as other avenues, you know, there's no shortage of them. You know, we look at how connected the world is, you know, through social media, through Facebook, um, and, and, you know, every single means you have uh, the ability to connect on, on some level. So to simply not, you know, shy away from that. And even if, you know, you don't feel like, hey, I'm a terrible writer, just, you know, simply start writing and putting your thoughts out there and sharing them with the world that there's only one way to improve at any of this. And that's to simply do it and, and not be afraid and you'll gradually improve. And, you know, you never know who the one person you're going to connect with change their life forever or, you know, you know, maybe hundreds or, or, or thousands. Um, so to simply 
know them, you know, and not have any sort of external value be put on what you're saying or what you're doing. Um, you know, for me, it was the greatest lesson. And, uh, you know, as I said, the world of social media, there's no, you know, shortage. Take your pick of, you know, the TikToks and the Facebooks and Instagrams. Um, but again, for me, there's nothing that I enjoy more than, you know, face to face, you know, with, with an actual audience. Um, and again, you know, always go back and joke, you know, where I lure them in with, you know, the world that I was brought up in and surfing that people are entertained by. And I found threads that I can easily, you know, steer off course and then bring in, you know, the more important conversations and ideas that I, I want to leave people with. So get creative and have fun with it and, uh, and don't be afraid. Thank you, Greg. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And also just how you have faced your own fears about telling stories. I think that probably resonates with many people. And I saw some heads nodding as well. Um, it looks like we have a couple of questions coming in in the chat. And we're, I'm going to ask a few questions of my own for the panelists. But as I do so, if you have any questions around your own storytelling or how you can um, you know, reflect on some of those mindsets shared earlier, I please just encourage you to ask those questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So first of all, I see a question here from Kimberly and it actually resonates with a question I wanted to ask, which is around moving people through fear. And we know based on brain science, right, that when people are in their downstairs brains, their lizard brains, you might've heard of, they can't act, right? We go to fight, flight, or freeze, or now they're saying flock. So we go and be around other people that are like us and fight each other, right? So we actually have to calm fear and move people again into the empathetic part of their brains towards hope and solutions if we wanna move people to take action. And so I'm curious from Ken, from Gabriella, from Greg, you know, how do you paint that picture of hope and solutions? What are stories where you've seen that that, that plays out? And how do we move people beyond the, obviously ocean acidification and climate change is so scary. And, and you know, Kimberly says here, you know, even some of the messengers like fishermen, commercialization, right? Corporate greed, people might be scared of that too. So how do we move people from there into those solutions and hope that really drive action? Um, I, I'll take that one. I'll take that one because that's, uh, that's uh, something very common when you're in the news business. I mean, because we're not an entertainment show, we're a news business. So everybody's like, yeah, everything is doom and gloom. But then you come up with these stories. So you have to give it some, some triggers to get people to act and not to get fear and not to get fearful. And so what we do is, um, as I was sharing with Kimberly there, so just to go to the fishermen immediately uh, on a ground level, they, I learned from the people at Heal the Bay, you have to go and talk to them and create a report with them and be there when they're fishing, as they're fishing, to talk to them about, hey, you, this is such a little fish, just release it. This is not going to be much for you kind of thing. Um, but when it comes to big stories, for example, yes, you do have to have one uh, ray of hope. And that usually comes with the stories where we do more educational stories rather than reporting facts. And that would be, for example, a story that we did. Um, we select, again, as I said, we tailor the stories and we uh, selected a story that we did with an organization at the Natural History Museum they have a group of people, they, they have a program called Disco, and what they do, and among other things, is they go to teachers in underserved communities, and they bring them into a program, and they bring these Latino teachers from downtown LA who live five miles from the ocean and have never been to the ocean. Listen to this. And so they bring them, these teachers, to the ocean, and they talk to them about the ocean. They have them spend a day in the ocean. They put them on a boat. They show them the little amazing little creatures in the ocean. And so they come back to their communities and they talk about this with hope and amazement. That's the core of it. And then I think that that's what we need to do the work. We need to do the work from the ground up, right? So that then that kid goes back home and tells the dad who usually goes fishing, dad, maybe you shouldn't go fishing today. Right? I don't know, something like that. That's the magic that we're looking for. To, uh, to follow up on that, because that, that is a great and powerful story that, that is, is so, it, it fills people with hope and, some, and joy. 
uh, I want to share a storytelling tip and I want to share a story that may relate to that. The tip is, and, and as Gabriela said, you really have to know your audience. You have to be curious about them. So if it's a commercial fisherman who might be worried that you're going to create a marine protected area and now they can't make a living, um, you have to understand that fear. And then you have to understand what part of the story helps them say, okay, I may have some short-term loss here, but these marine protected areas are going to be producing a lot more fish that will swim outside the boundaries of the protected area. And I'll be able to catch them then. It's, it's like preserving the seed corn so that I can continue doing this in the future. Um, to the fear story, and this is, this is like, you never, you know, Greg mentioned, you never know who you're going to influence with this story. We have a sea otter exhibit at the Aquarium in Monterey. Big hit. People love sea otters, like nutrias, uh, marinas. And families come, family vacation, one of those bonding moments. We had a family come years ago, little boy, six years old with his dad. They're there at a feeding program for the otters, and they hear from our staff that sea otters are threatened by disease from cat litter that's washing into the sea and they're getting a, an infectious disease that's killing the otters. And the little boy was devastated. He's next to his dad and he looked up to his dad and said, dad, you've got to do something. The otters are dying and paralyzed by fear. Well, it turns out in this case, his dad was a member of the state legislature, a fellow named Dave Jones. Dave Jones reached out to our staff after that family visit, after hearing the fear in his son's voice and the tears in his eyes, said, what can I do? And among the suite of legislation that he got passed was the California Sea Otter tax checkoff that's still on the income tax form today, that's raised, I think, in excess of $4 million now for sea otter research and conservation efforts. So you give people a solution, you give them an opportunity, that would, what, that would be the, the legislation <laughs> mindset there. Dave, Dave Jones had that and listened with it, but it was in the context of the family visit to the aquarium and the amazing wildlife. So three different hardwired mindsets at work with long-term powerful impacts. Amazing story, Ken. Thanks, Greg. I think, um... I'd like to just touch on the idea of fear and I think a message that I, I really try and convey because um, it is and, and I'm one of them you know who read the news headlines you know you can get down so easily and feel like oh there's nothing I can do to make a difference and you know that fear paralyzes you into uh, to inaction um, it's to actually look at you know the the root of the emotion of, of fear and why we're actually feeling you know that um and a lot of it is directly correlated with feelings of sadness or grief for you know what's being lost you know or can you know share the story of you know sea uh, sea otters you know um you know the child felt that grief and the sadness um and i think where we as a society have kind of gotten off track is um, instilling this idea that to feel sadness, to feel grief, and to evil fear are negative emotions. Um, and that it's not something that we should be okay outwardly expressing, and therefore we sort of just bottle it up and, you know, absorb it and go on with, with our lives. Where the truth is, all, you know, those emotions are, uh, from my perspective, um, are an expression of the love that we have, you know, for what's actually being lost. Uh, you know, we feel sad, you know, for the otters, you know, because we don't like the idea of, you know, that they may no longer have, you know, the home or that we were, you know, impacting them in a negative way. You know, we feel grief at the thought of, oh, you know, another, you know, animal extinction that uh, we somehow had, uh, you know, an inadvertent, you know, part to. So to directly, you know, see that, you know, grief, sadness, and even fear is just kind of the opposite reflection of the love, you know, for what's being lost and, and turning it into a different light. And um, as soon as I feel like you can sort of, you know, bypass that and create the connection, you know, I always like to say, you know, the deeper the sadness that we feel, there's an expansion for the greater love uh, or joy, you know, that we can experience on the opposite end and realize that they exist, you know, simultaneously at the same time 
Um, and, and to see it as that you know, reflection, that it's the love for you know, what's being lost as to why we feel the sadness and why we might you know, kind of retort to you know, inaction or, or wrong action. And to hang in that place of love and know that you know, that is the root of you know, why we're feeling this way. And from there, that's where you know, the greatest action you know, takes place you know, in, in, in anything that we do in life. So that's sort of a message I, I like to sort of you know, incorporate and you know, I've experienced through my world of uh, big wave surfing and, and being regularly exposed to you know, fear-inducing situations. And then you know, the whole rest of the gamut of emotions, which we've all you know, experienced at some point in our lives. Um, so to bring it back that, you know, all it is, is, you know, a reflection of the love for we have for the ocean, for one another. And uh, if we can hold on to that, you know, day to day, even with, you know, the hard, challenging news that we get, um, you know, experiences that we may be going through and, you know, use that as sort of our anchor point for, you know, our actions moving forward. You know, that's, you know, where the greatest progress and, and growth happens. So that's beautifully said. Thank you, Greg. Um, I just want to pause and like take that all in for a second because it just very beautifully said. Um, I also see that Natalie has a question, or actually a set of questions that I'd like to pose to you all. And I think these are great ones um, because I think many of the folks on here are balancing this need between making the emotional connection, which we're talking about, but also making sure that the science comes through too. Um, so she says, coming from a scientific background, how do we better communicate ocean science in a human way without reducing scientific integrity of the message? And then there's a couple more questions here. So is this intersection valuable in promoting buy-in for management decisions and any information from improving effective science communication overall? So again, three different questions there, and I'll just invite anyone to take any that they're comfortable with around merging the human connection with the scientific here. And Ken, I see you're unmuting yourself, so I'll let you take yeah. that first. The, the aquarium is a science-based organization. I mean, that's the foundation of what gives us our credibility, but we're also an informal science center, which means we have to communicate with a public that didn't come for a postgraduate course in science when they walked in the doors. They came to have fun with their families or their friends. So. I, I, I think that you can, by being a good communicator and working on your storytelling, communicate the science without, I'm, gonna, I'm blanking out on the guy, and I apologize, I'll find his name later, but he, he literally wrote a book called Don't Be Such a Scientist, because there's a language of science that's off-putting, that's alienating, that doesn't build that emotional bond with people, but you can be true to the science and tell a passionate story that's rooted in the science to move the audience. So it, it's discovering a new language. Um, uh, it's, there's a great quote from Mark Twain, uh, the, the writer who apologized. He said, I apologize for writing you a long letter. I didn't have the time to write a short one. And that's the essence of storytelling. You, we've got so much to tell, so many issues to bring up, so many things we want to say. Pare it down. We're not writing an epic poem. We're not writing a novel. We're doing a news story for the evening, evening news. We are doing a haiku. And that's where the emotional impact comes through. Yeah. And I actually will just point to some neuroscience that shows that we actually retain information better when it's in story form than if it's just a list. We cannot memorize 10 facts on a list, but if you embed some of the most important ones in a story, we actually will remember it a week later. So that's pretty interesting in and of itself. Uh, Gabriella. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I get paid to do every day. <laughs> so I have to get all of Greg's love for the ocean and all of Ken's science and mush it in and give it into a good story so that you can go and talk about it so that you have the right words to express that science into loving terms and so you so that the message can go through and that is exactly what we do um that's what i was telling you we get a lot of training to do that and and again we've made our stories every time shorter and shorter the piece that i was sharing with you is a two three three and a half minute parts and um and now we're at two two minutes and 30 seconds 
Um, I, and I want to say something that is very important for all those storytellers out there. If the story is compelling, it can last a lot longer, but it needs to be compelling. People will sit for 22 minutes without blinking, watching some vice story that is compelling enough to get you and to sit there. So the, 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 the messaging about it has to be short has to be taken with a grain of salt because it doesn't always work like that. If the story is good enough and it's not stuffed with data that is going to put you to sleep, then absolutely go for sprinkling the data here and there and, and making that emotional connection. My personal story, I learned how to tell good scientific stories by watching Cosmos. Carl Sagan was my hero. I mean, I could sit there for hours and understand the black hole. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not a scientist, but that is, and Jacques Cousteau, of course. You watch Jacques Cousteau and, and, and Cosmos, you see, you see Carl Sagan, and then you know how to tell the story so you practice enough, yeah. Thank you, Gabriela, wonderful perspective there. Greg? Um, I, for me, it always comes down to really understanding the audience before I go in there, you know, it's like, uh, you know, a, a recipe, uh, depending on who you're going to be catering to, you know, how much humor, you know, is going to, you know, be best absorbed by the audience, uh, how lighthearted, how serious, you know, how much, you know, science and information, um, and, and really understanding the demographic that you're trying to communicate to, you know, before. Uh, and that's, that's all the difference in the world from, you know, walking away, actually, you know, where, I remember the first time I ever, my mom was an elementary school teacher, you know, and she would have me come in, you know, speak to the kids in the classroom. And the first time I ever did, I, I was talking to them like they were, you know, adults. And I could just see these blank stares on their faces like, well, you know, that was, you know, both a, a waste of my time and, and their time and, um, yeah, you know, big valuable lesson for me. But uh, just understanding that and, and, and catering, um, you know, Again, the messages that you want to convey, how well you think they will be to re uh, received, um, you know, and Ken has outlined, you know, multiple occasions, you know, the sort of heart map to, you know, re reaching people in different circumstances, um, and uh, and and following those sort of guidelines uh, makes it very uh, more palatable uh, on on the receiving end, and you won't be standing up there, you know, as as the storyteller. Uh, feeling like uh, you've just flopped uh, big time. Thank you, Greg. So I'm hearing know your audience, keep it short unless it's extremely compelling and then it's okay to go a little long and um, embed that information. Don't need to dumb it down, but embed it within the stories that are compelling because people will actually retain it even, even better here. Um, I see a couple more questions and we're about to wrap up here. So actually, I just want to invite the three panelists again to share a last thought. And if there's one thing that you hope people really take from this session today, what is it? And Gabrielle, I'll turn first to you again. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to start here. I want to say, um, I just remembered one of the stories that I that I did was for the Vaquita Marina. I don't know if everybody, well, everybody should know who the Vaquita Marina is, right? The little poor boys that is about to go away in the Sea of Cortez. And I went to my news director and I said, I want to do a story of the Vaquita Marina. We only have, at that point, it was 66. I think we have like less than 10 at this point if, if they're not all gone. And he said like, the what? And I said, Vaquita Marina. And he goes, Okay, why does it matter to anybody? So this was a task, right? So I had to just think really hard and I did a story that was kind of fun, telling pe asking people around, do you know what a vaquita marina is? So people would say like, vaca, marina, maybe the mix of a cow and a fish. And so we were doing all kinds of crazy things and, and I called the story, what the heck is that? And so it worked so fantastic and phenomenal. And I had to come up with cartoons and we put it inside the ocean and we got really creative to get the message through. And at the end, many people were writing to us saying, oh my gosh, I had no idea. We had the Vaquita Marina endemic in Mexico and it's dying and it's going away. So it was very, very good to see that. Then 
then we make more serious stories about it once we knew that a lot of our audience had already seen what Avaquita Marina wants. But to introduce those, uh, to introduce those those points, those those new uh, mm -hmm. characters and all those new concepts, you need to get creative. Don't take yourself so seriously. Yourself, mm -hmm. take the story seriously and make it a little bit fun. Make it compelling and throw the data, sprinkle it in. So that would be the thing that I would love to see everybody doing. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, Ken, what about you? One one thing you hope people take away from this? Well, I'm going to give you a message map for this at the end since I'm talking about it. Storytelling is essential to moving your mission forward. And to be effective at storytelling, you need to create a storytelling culture in your organization, collect and curate those stories so that they are telling the message, delivering the message you want to deliver, and finding and nurturing a diversity of voices to tell those stories to your audiences. California is a majority minority state, and people not only listen to stories that relate to their circumstances, they listen to storytellers with whom they can identify, whether it's by their ethnic or cultural background, their socioeconomic background, that is gonna make the stories more compelling. They will stick better and get you to your mission. Thank you, Ken, great points. And Greg, over to you. One thing you hope people will take away. I think it would be the simple reminder that we are all in this together. We didn't reach this point in time and you know, the array of environmental challenges that we're up against you know, overnight. And it wasn't you know, one individual or one single corporation. Uh, we've got to this point collectively as one human family. Uh, and it was billions of decisions and actions made by the individual over a relatively short period of time. You know, we're talking a you know, hundred some odd years that have brought us to this very challenging um, and you know, important time in our lives. So don't ever feel like as an individual, your actions don't matter because we've all contributed to you know, this point in time to reaching here in some way or another. I'll be the first to raise my hand where I was never you know, that thoughtful you know, in the amount that I traveled and how I was consuming in my younger years. And I'm, I'm still not perfect, you know, striving to be better. But the acknowledgement that everything that we do and the decisions that we make uh, and choices you know, to speak and share our passions and, and you know, try and educate others or help others, uh, it does matter. You know, that we look at the state of the world now, it's because of individual actions, again, by billions of people. Um, and it's gonna take billions of actions by billions of people to change the course that we're on, you know, to the future that we all know why we're here having these discussions in our own unique lives, um, doing the best that we can. So uh, know that you know, what you're doing day to day does matter and uh, does have an effect and impact um, in the course you know that we're all uh, so desperately striving to uh, to move towards so thank everybody for uh, the work that you do the passion that you give towards protecting our ocean natural world and and for being here and having these conversations and, and learning from one another beautifully said and beautiful note to end on I just want to thank all three of you again as well as everybody who attended and participated. It was wonderful to see all the comments in chat. And again, thank you to Environment California, the other organizations who have put on California Ocean Day, as well as Resources Legacy Fund. Um, and with that, we'll wrap, but enjoy the rest of the day. Take action. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> thank you so much, Alicia. That was wonderful. And to all of the panelists uh, for opening up your heart and sharing your work and your stories. It was incredibly moving and, um, and in, 
inspiring and educational. So I know that we're all going to be better storytellers after this, and um, hopefully folks will be bringing those um, those ideas into the lobby meetings that we're having. We've been having dozens of lobby meetings already today. We've got many, many more to go. Um, and so we'll be able to hopefully move some of the decision makers in our state capital to action. Um, we've got some great opportunities to advance important ocean protection legislation this very session. And so um, let's make sure we keep, keep that up. Um, and then we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes with our next panel. So um, let me just, let's see, I'm gonna, folks can just hang tight and we'll get ready. We're gonna transition to our next panel, just a moment. <laughs> 